Hey guys, I'm Kate. Welcome back to my channel and today I have a writing vlog for y'all where I'm working on re-outlining Project Death while also working on a serial. So all of this took place just a smidge before Camp NaNoWriMo started. But I also reached back into my archives of some old surveys that I completed on this channel. Once upon a time I asked y'all if you could ask your fellow writers any one question, what would it be? And I've sort of gone through those questions very, very slowly. There were a bunch of them, which is phenomenal. And so throughout this writing vlog, I'm going to be answering some of those questions, but also trying to kind of like toss them back to you guys who are watching and see if you could answer these questions too, because me and the people who completed the survey are very curious. So if you want to look below, there will be timestamps. If you're like, some of these questions don't interest me, some of them do, and amongst all of this will be peppered in my writing vlog. It's also a one-day vlog, so you'll kind of get to see what I managed to accomplish in a day. Before we get started, a couple of the questions cover if other writers are worried about their passion outweighing their talent, how would your writing change if you knew it would never be published, and how do you balance quality and speed? So without further ado, let me go ahead and take you into the vlog, and I am excited to get y'all's takes in the comments down below. Ooh. I got a ginormous uh, water jug yesterday because it reminded me of when I played tennis and you just like plug these around. Um, and I was like, you know what? Maybe I drink more water again. But I have enjoyed waking up and then starting by just getting a few words in at least. I think I got, what else? Like, I got 149 words and I actually bridged the gap between two scenes. So basically I have the sisters, um, the sister witches, where they and the warlocks, warlocks had been sort of one-upping each other, um, but also like testing each other. And so it's just been kind of fun. Excited to see what they're going to do now because I have this thing where they're going to loosely pair up to help solve a problem that a baby witch accidentally creates but then they're gonna both manage to like flip it on each other um and be like you're the reason this actually dangerous thing she had a hold of because it didn't happen before the warlocks were in town but of course the warlocks who are part of the council are like these fucking evil witches that we've been on the hunt for <laughs> not knowing all the while <laughs> anyways yes i'm very excited but i figured before i make my coffee i would answer one question which asked how much do you read? So I've actually been doing a pretty good job of tracking my reading this year. One of the other things I track is how many of my personal books I have read and how many I've bought so I kind of get a new number each year. Uh, I don't want to talk about that one yet so I won't. <laughs> but so far for the year I have read 21 books, which means I'm ahead by seven books. For fiction, I just finished, I don't know if you can tell, Daisy Jones and the Six. I think I'll actually be editing part of a reading vlog for that today. And for nonfiction, while I'm currently reading Cultish, I actually just finished Root and Ritual, Timeless Ways to Connect to Land, Lineage, Community, and the Self. So it'll be fun for me to rank uh, my reads at the end of the year, but obviously, one of the best things we can do as writers is to read a lot. Um, so it's write a lot, it's read a lot, yes. And it's also really important to kind of be up and current on the genre that you write, um, which is something that I've struggled with as I don't often buy recent releases. Or when I do, I try and get them from the library. And you know, that can put me on several months wait, which I don't mind, but it just means that I'm like usually not super current. Um, so that's something that I've thought about and I might want to see about changing in the future. It's just logistically how I want to go about that. Or maybe what I'm doing now is just fine. But this is my best reading year so far in however many years. I usually set my goal to be like 24 books. Um, so that's two a month or 26 books. That's one book every two weeks. So oh, I put my reading goal as 30 books this year. I actually, I think because what happened is I did all right last year. Yeah, I read 29 books of my 24 goals. So I was like, you know what? Let's up it to 30. <laughs> so I'd love to know how much y'all read and also maybe your favorite most recent read 
Yes. I have a little bit of time, so I'm going to make my cappuccino and then I need to feed the dogs and eat. Another question asked was how do you get over the thoughts of your writing not being good enough as you're still writing? And I think this is part of the reason I like to fast draft it because a lot of the times for me, the first couple drafts is just really figuring out what the plot needs to be and who the characters are and really what story I'm trying to tell. So the writing is like not the best sometimes. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes I get little nuggets and be like, oh, beautiful. But a lot of the times it's not up to a standard that I really like, but it's just how my brain needs to figure it out. So I deal with this pretty often, but I also will forget that I deal with this. So I was on Jess's channel for the Worldwide Write-A-Thon. Phoebe and I were hanging out with her, getting some sprints in, doing all the fun things. And uh, Phoebe talked about how, you know, she's heard of a lot of writers where when they go from like line editing and revising and things you're doing when the story's really far along and then you go back to doing the first draft a lot of people will have this feeling of like oh no i'm i'm terrible again where did my writing skills go what did all this what happened because you were so used to reading your later draft work that seeing your first draft work again is like a jolt and i I know, I know having done this before that that will happen, but for some reason hearing that other people struggle with that too was like giving myself a little bit of a, I don't know, wrapping myself up in a little blanket. <laughs> Being like, it's okay, <laughs> they're there. See this thing you thought was just a you thing? Not just a you thing. <laughs> and that has helped me so much, for instance, as I am drafting for the first time, you know, a couple of these episodes, but also basically what happened was when I had sent Project Death over to Jess at the end of January, I then immediately started working on the first draft of our romance novel. And I write romance more or less all the time, unless I'm finishing up a project and like it's taking all my focus like Project Death was. And so I was writing that first draft and some parts of it were just bad and I it was making me mad and sad and all of the emotions that are more than three letters. <laughs> Anyways, it was definitely a moment of like, why can't this first draft compare to my draft forwards? Um, and, and they just can't, or that's not how my brain works for it. So anyways, it was just, it was affirming. Um, and I'm gonna remember that going forward. It was kind of like an aha moment for me. So hopefully maybe it's an aha moment for you too. <laughs> that you will always have the next draft to fix it up and tinker with it. I genuinely think that each draft, I improve by leaps and bounds um, on, just like the readability and the flow of the words and picking out a better word for things. I'm also someone who will fully rewrite the paragraph or rewrite the page or rewrite the entire story, even if the beats were right, but like it just was not doing what I needed it to do. So I guess how do you get over it is like an acceptance. And also this isn't just happening to you, um, but you gotta keep going so you can get to the part where you make the words really good. Yeah. I have just a few more minutes before it is time to feed the pups, so I'm gonna try and get a little bit more words in. Let's do this. Four hundred and thirty-four. Hell yeah. Go ahead, girls. Good job. Good job, Sadie. I'm at 798 words. I meant to start working on my video, but I did finish my coffee, got more words. Can't be too mad at that. However, I do suspect it is time to finish this one up. Thank you, Vanessa. In a similar vein, someone asked, how do you balance quality and speed? Which I think is such a great question and I would actually love to know everyone how to, 
how does anyone do this? <laughs> Since I already talked about how I like to fast draft, I guess in the first couple of drafts, I really don't try to balance speed and quality. I'm not saying I'm just like typing out shit, but it's mostly just trying to figure out the story as I mentioned, right? So it's actually the later drafts that take me longer because I'm fine tuning the story, but I'm also really working on the words on a per word basis to make it as good as it can be. So for instance, when I'm looking at Project Death Draft 5 now, I'm planning on working on it this bit of June, I've been working on it the whole time doing kind of timelining and rearranging stuff. So all of June, all of July, all of August, and I'm thinking of doing probably some into September, which really means that I'll probably be done in October. <laughs> <laughs> now that doesn't mean I'm working exclusively on that of course, but it does still mean that with Project Death as my focus, I'm expecting this draft to take me anywhere from three to four to five months. <laughs> so I don't know that I actually balance the speed and the quality. And obviously that's not counting the several months I took off when Jess had my story and just kind of letting it sit in my head a little bit longer. So I'd be very curious to hear about this from other people. I think there's a middle ground between what I do in my first couple of drafts and then my friends who revise so much and edit so often that they never actually finish a first draft. You know, there's there's got to be a somewhere in between there um, so that maybe you're not having to do five months worth on draft five or whatever or three. You know, three months worth doesn't sound bad. Five months sounds crazy for some reason. And yet I know that's probably how much it's gonna take. <laughs> so it goes. Which I think is followed up by an excellent question as we're getting into draft five, draft six for me, which is when the heck do I even consider getting an agent at when in the process? So I think the general advice that people will say is that Hopefully someone else has read your work before you're going to an agent. Hopefully you've had some beta reader feedback. Hopefully you've had a critique partner. Y'all have exchanged work and they've read it. There are of course stories of people who never do that and still manage to get an agent, but hopefully you'll have done that stage. So for me, what I'm thinking is it's kind of at the point of once I finish the fifth draft and I've gotten readers to give me feedback again, as long as there's no overwhelming overhaul I need to do again and there's just kind of like nitpicky things that's when I would fix the nitpicky stuff that I agreed with and then it would be time to to start querying. So I guess for me it's almost like once you've made it the story the best it can be. Yes. Obviously the agent and then the publisher will work on it with you to make it even more marketable hopefully or kind of you know fix any things that they think like this is a great story but and we can sell this but it might help if, you know. So sometimes that is like draft 10 for people. Sometimes that is their third draft. It all depends on how you count drafts. So I'd rather just throw that part out and be like, when you're feeling confident in the story that you've made it as good as you can be and you've also had other eyes on it. They've agreed that there's something there and they would like to see it in stores. Yeah, as it is now, 150. That video I was working on should have just gone live. So we'll see if there are any I guess I should see if it has indeed gone live. Refresh. Oh no. <laughs> Yay! Okay. Oh, see, a very nice comment. Yay! I do have one other thing before I switch to a little bit more writing. I got sent what looks like book mail to me. Yay! Oh my God, that is so cute. Thank you, Becky, I'm so excited. To Kate, this is the book I mentioned I would send you during your Patreon live stream. It came out in May 2022 and reached the New York Times bestseller list for the week of May 22nd. And number 15 in hardcover fiction, the author Shelby Van Pelt is part of a query group that I started in 2020, which is a subgroup of the main online writing group that I'm a part of. We've all been working to support Shelby's book and she was extremely kind in putting the members of the query group in her acknowledgements. I hope you'll enjoy this remarkable book if you have the time to read it. I know you mentioned you could check this out the library instead of me sending it, but I thought it would be nice to give something back for all the time. Oh, you've put into supporting the writing community. The live streams and videos help keep me motivated to write. Thank you for all the things you do. I've included other, a few other small items I thought you might like. Becky, this is so cute. Oh my God. Look at this. What a beautiful cover. I, oh my gosh. Now we need to see 
Becky, where are you in these acknowledgements? <laughs> Look at that. To my online writing group right around the block, and in particular, the querying support crew, thank you for your feedback and your support. Becky Grenville. Ah. Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm so excited. This is beautiful. Thank you, Becky. <gasps> oh my God, may the fourth be with you. Oh, Becky, it's so cute. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Star Wars in the background. <laughs> it is literally the coolest thing ever that we're getting to the place where several writers that we know or that are us <laughs> are getting their books published. It's just so cool. Sadie. What the heck, Sadie? Oh, good job, girls. <laughs> Zelda, come on. Silly, silly dog. Who wants a treat for being so good? Woo. Oh. Buffy, sit. Zelda, sit. Wait. She gets treats when the girls do, too. Wait. Sadie. Good job. All right, and now I'm going to open up the two different Project Deaths, Draft 4 and Draft 5. You can kind of see Draft 5. I've been working on the different acts and I have several bits where I'm moving the chapters around from where they were previously. I talked about this during the Worldwide Marathon stream, but I had sent Jess a picture where once I've reshuffled these scenes, after the midpoint, I only had 20,000 words written down. <laughs> because of the reshuffle, I moved some things up. Um, but I also had some big concepts at the end that were not fully fleshed out. Uh, to quote Jess, it was a little bit stressy messy. With potential, but stressy messy. And so anyways, I, I think that all of the additional words um, will be in this back half of the novel that I'll be adding about 30,000 plus maybe. And then the front half, they'll be a little bit tighter than I currently have. So anyways, I will be unsurprised if ultimately this final draft five is over 100,000 words, which will be the biggest thing I've ever written. But <laughs> I think that's what the story needs. So anyways, I'm now at act two B moving into act three. So I just need to figure out some things here where I need to slow it down. <laughs> I figured out something else. <laughs> so I'm slowing it down, but each new scene is also contributing to both character development and like forward progression of the plot. So like as long as the new scenes that I'm adding have those two things, then it's serving its purpose. And again, I just had to slow stuff down because this last little bit is a fucking whirlwind. Also, we are very close to Love Island time. I need to clean up my desktop since what I do when I have new videos, I just like save it all to the desktop so I can find it easily. And we need to go over another question. How do you deal with the slow burn that is cranking out your book for months and years? Yes, writing a book is such a long process. <laughs> I was talking to my dad about this because I enjoy my dad's writing and he also used to do a lot of academic writing from when he was a professor and my dad absolutely abhors the sort of revision editing process. We've had a lot of chats about this. <laughs> recently because I keep trying to convince him to do like Camp Nano or something and it's he's you know what he's like it's he doesn't think it's for him which is totally fair but he was watching one of my videos and I was talking about being excited for this next Project Death revision. Many a year I have been working on Project Death and I just thought it was really funny and sweet how he kind of like was amazed. <laughs> that I could still be enjoying working on the same thing for so long. And I was like, it feels so different, of course, with each revision because I'm learning something new and I'm trying to make the story better. Um, but the slow burn, that's definitely why I need breaks between my drafts, uh, because otherwise you can get really bogged down and feeling like you're not making enough progress fast enough. Yeah, while it is a slow burn, the burn I, it stays lit, stays aflame, <laughs> just because I am making it better, right? So I don't know if that's, that answers the question, um, but I would be curious if anyone else has the same sort of struggle uh, 
you're just like, man, it is a long process. Have any of y'all turned to like novellas or short stories because of that? <laughs> Someone else asked, if you're like me and find it difficult to imagine what the places in your story actually look like, how do you combat it without avoiding description completely? I am a sufferer. Sufferer? I am also the instigator of white room syndrome um, within my stories where basically I just don't describe things. Actually, I don't describe a lot of stuff unless it is immediately relevant to what's about to happen oftentimes or if it especially pertains to a character and what they would notice. So I might not ever describe a character except through the eyes of one person who, you know, has a crush on them or something. No one else will be described them, but of course this person has a crush would be maybe more focused on that kind of thing. You know, so what happens though is that people understandably want a little bit more to paint the picture. <laughs> so I'm just constantly adding more description back in. What I do find helpful when I realize that I've done this, which is every time, <laughs> is that I will actually kind of actively go into a room, look around and see what I notice first. And then when I go back to writing, I'll be like, okay, well, you know, for the plot, I might need this or this, but what else would I notice? Okay, well, what's the lighting situation like? Like right now, the light's not super bright. It is reflecting off of my glasses. You know, it's these kind of things that I notice living it, but would not ever describe. So it's just kind of taking the 30 seconds to describe what is literally in front of me and then taking that lesson and putting it back into the story. So this is also something that I might have to do a couple of times, but ultimately I'm just kind of always adding description back in, but you and me, we're in this together. <laughs> All right, I have about an hour left in which I would like to write before I go to bed tonight. So let's see how many more words we can get in and also how many more questions. I don't know that I'm gonna make it to act three in Project Death's kind of remapping, but if I get close, I will be excited. I was saying on stream the other day that it's so interesting because this kind of work takes so long, but that it doesn't look like much is happening. <laughs> and it always cracks me up where I'm like, I am literally like in the process of creating new scenes where they did not exist before because I've rearranged so many things and combined some stuff and like done all, you know, I'm, the story is moving all around me, uh, but it does not like visually. <laughs> have any indication of that, it always makes me chuckle. But in my brain, so much has happened. Another question was, do you ever worry that your passion outweighs your talent and all the freaking time is the answer? I imagine that's the answer for a lot of people, just creatives in general. Often that little thought spiral, oh, that little thought spiral of being like, I am trash. I am no good. I will never be as good as I want to be. <laughs> Which like in some respects is probably true because I think that as with anything, once you hit your goal, it's like, well, now that you've achieved that, you have a new goal. So you're not able to fully see like how far you've come um, or appreciated in the same way because now you're like, ah, I'm still reaching. Um, we're constantly reaching. My only hope is that with considerable practice, I say as I look directly at the screen with considerable practice and just keep it on, keep it on, that talent or that skill will just continue to improve. It may never match my passion, <laughs> but hopefully it will just keep going up. The passion is what fuels me to keep going up, right? Yeah, but very easy to spiral on that. <laughs> And finally, I want to answer this question. I had 12 that I'd written out and I think I'm only going to answer eight, but how would your writing change if you knew it would never be published? Oh, this one is so interesting to me because I feel like you have to take out the self-publishing aspect completely um, in order to answer this question. Because in theory, you know, with the way that the industry is trending, we'll continue to have ways to self-publish and get our work out there if we so want to go that route, right? But I'm trying to think of how it would change um, and what I would write. I Would it change that much? I don't know 
that what I'm writing would change that much um, because I want to be a hybrid uh, author. I want to publish kind of niche things that I don't think would ever get picked up but I'd also love to publish like some popular stuff and get to have a relationship with a traditional publisher and an agent and like experience that um, and see what that could potentially do for my career, right? The only thing I can think is that if it was never going to be published, like if no one was going to see it, I know those aren't quite the same because I could just give it to friends and family, right? But if it was never going to be published, I don't know that I would ever get it to that level of editing. Is that the way I should say it? I think for me, the most fun part of writing is in the kind of usually third draft area where I've done the zero draft, the first draft, and kind of discovery written my way through what I'm trying to tell. I've done the second draft to do the like big plot holes potentially. And the third draft might be more plot holes, but it, like I'm really fine tuning, you know? So I'm saying third draft, it could be fifth draft, like this fifth draft of Project Death I hope is going to like kind of fill up all the holes that I had from the last draft. Um, once I get it to that stage though, once I'm content in myself where I'm like, wow, I've made this story the best it could be, the story itself, I don't know that I would bother with the final line edits if I was never going to be published. Because yeah, I just, for like my personal purposes, I would still want to make the writing as good as it could be, but that's not the same as when I go to like hire an editor and like get it up to publishing standards, you know? Yeah. I mean, if other people were gonna read it period, like if there was a weird distinction between published and like just a whole bunch of other people could read it, I would still do that. But yeah, I think that's the only way it would change really. I still write my really weird ideas that I think are fun and I don't think anybody else would really find as fun as me, you know, just like through my lifetime of varied interests and like, me, all the things that make me me kind of thing. I'm like purposely writing for this one person. <laughs> I, I am my audience. So I'm writing all those things still. So I can't imagine how much more it would change. But I think that is a fascinating question and I would love to know, please do comment down below, what y'all think for your own purposes. One, if you even like want to pursue publication, this might change your answer. But two, if you did want to pursue publication, how would your writing change? if that was like completely taken off the table, self-publishing included, off the table. Like I am the almighty and I've said you shall not be <laughs> Let me know. And actually with any of these questions, please do let me know. I am half a glass in almost of my wine. So I'm gonna get back to the writing now with 30 more minutes, try and finish up that episode. And then I'm going to hop into bed and get to reading Coltish. But that's going to be it for me. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all very soon with a new video. Bye!